Hello and welcome everyone to the 11th appointment of the IFAT Innovation Talks. Before we start, I would like to remind you that today's event is being recorded. By joining the event, you are agreeing to the recording taking place and for it to be shared in our platforms. As usual, I would like to invite you to visit our event page to check the speaker profiles, the event's concept note, and agenda. John is sharing with you the link in the chat box right now. The chat box will be open during today's, um, during today's session. So please let us know where you're joining us from. We ask that you use the chat responsibly by keeping your post related only to the content of today's session. No commercial advertising, please. Today, we will be talking about innovative climate finance. Climate finance is funding at the local, national, or transnational level that supports the actions needed to combat climate change. It affects everything, everything from national policy to the ground level changes that make concrete differences in people's lives and well-being. Climate finance is needed both to mitigate the emissions causing climate change and to help communities and economies adapt to the changes that are now inevitable. There's a lot that goes into determining how to pay for the costs associated with climate change. In 2015, at the 21st United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP21, nearly all the world's countries committed to nationally determined contributions towards meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. Last year in Glasgow at uh, COP26, many countries registered new or updated NDCs in light of the latest evidence on the progression of climate change. Today's webinar will be an opportunity to take a stock of the progress of countries and private sector actors in this context since COP26. And uh, we will always also be looking at the challenges that we are facing. We aim also to provide an opportunity to analyze global trends in the evaluation of emissions reductions, adjusted carbon standards and trading, and how this source of financing will be leveraged going forward. Without much further ado, I am honored to introduce Joe Puri, IFAT's Associate Vice President of the Strategy and Knowledge Department, where she leads the organization's strategy work in IFAT's key areas targeting agriculture, climate, gender, nutrition, youth, and social inclusion. Before joining IFAT, Joe was head and director of the Independent Evaluation Office of the Green Climate Fund and deputy executive director of the International Initiative of Impact Evaluation. She has authored several books and published widely on policy guidance, measuring impact and evaluation. Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gladys. Such a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be opening this EFAD Innovation Talk webinar on climate finance and carbon markets because these are increasingly important to EFAD. At the sixth assessment of the IPCC, um, it was estimated that in the next decade alone, climate change will drive approximately anywhere between 30 to 130 million more people into extreme poverty. With the agriculture, forests, and other land use sector, so also AFOLU, uh, being the third largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, which is approximately one fifth of the overall global emissions that we are seeing today. So this is after energy and industry, so AFOLU comes third. About a third of these, a third of the overall AFOLU uh, emissions, a third, is attributed to smallholder farmers who are essentially EFAD stakeholders. Globally, like Gladys said, countries have committed to reducing their emissions as detailed in the nationally determined contributions under the UNFCCC, in the agriculture sector, but also and beyond. In line with EFAD's mandate, which is to strengthen environmental sustainability and climate resilience of the rural poor, um, so that we can really enable an inclusive and sustainable transformation of rural areas. Under the 12th replenishment cycle of EFAD, which is EFAD 12, which goes from 2022 to 2024, we are committed to ensuring that at least 40% of our core resources, 40% of our core resources are devoted to climate change adaptation and mitigation so that they can help countries support and reach their nationally determined contribution targets, as well as expand our capacity as an assembler of climate finance, which is the space that EFAD leads in. 
Now, the science of climate change is fairly simple, the, but the political path to stopping climate change from happening is infinitely more complex. Indeed, uh, complexity embodied in, um, in this overall area is the overall topic of carbon markets, which is what we're talking about. So as background, a year ago at COP26, there was a negotiation of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, and that was finalized. This article covers bilateral actions between, so that's between two governments, to exchange greenhouse gas emission reductions, but also creates a new multilateral mechanism to replace the old UNFCCC Kyoto Protocol's clean development mechanism, to name just a few. Now, since that time in Glasgow at COP26, countries have started to adjust their national frameworks to be able to internationally trade carbon credits and revenues and emission reductions. At the very same time, the main carbon standards involved in voluntary carbon markets, um, and I know Axel will be talking about this, have adjusted their approaches to these new options that have been offered to countries to value their greenhouse gas emission reductions. As a UN organization, we are quite cognizant of the decisions taken in Glasgow, especially related to Article 6, and really the need to enhance the environmental and climatic integrity of all transactions with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, carbon markets are only part of the solution and will only be a solution if they help to achieve the goal of generating real greenhouse gas emission reductions that put us on a path of 1.5 degrees warming and no more. It is clear today that investments in mitigating and adapting to climate change in the agriculture sector and in preventing and reversing related environmental and climatic degradation have to accelerate. It is really important for us to think about financing that we can bring so that we can support investments that are going to help us to either remove carbon emissions or avoid them. <clears throat> Supporting countries under Article 6 really offers the opportunities to mobilize climate finance at scale to co-finance adaptation and mitigation actions. Carbon offsets can be a really important way to channel funds to conservation, to sustainable development while reducing climate emissions. The webinar that we have today will be a fantastic opportunity to hear insights uh, from experts as well as from countries and the private sector in this context since COP26. Given that we have COP27 right around the corner, it is really important to see as to how we can reflect on what we can take forward, both as a way to increase the overall finance, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but third, and if I might say that, to also think about how we might redistribute some of this financing to the key stakeholders that matter most to EFAT. Those are the poor living in rural areas. Countries have different ways of handling their emission reduction, including those that are generated by the agriculture, forests, and land use and other land use sector. And the webinar today uh, will give us an opportunity to discuss challenges as well as progress of different countries in setting up their national frameworks in the context of reporting against the NDCs, their nationally determined contributions and Article 6. With that, I wish you all a really productive event and look forward to hearing the discussion that I know will be very rich. Over to you, Gladys. Thanks, thanks so much, Joe. It is indeed crucial to accelerate investments in mitigating and adapting to climate change in the agricultural sector and to help financing projects that can support efforts to remove and avoid carbon emissions. I am now pleased to introduce today's keynote speaker, Axel Michaelova, senior founding partner at Perspectives and researcher at the University of Zurich. Axel holds a PhD in economics and has worked on international climate policy instruments in the UNFCCC process since 1994. Axel is also president of the Zurich Carbon Market Association and member of the Board of Climate Strategies and the constituency of research and independent NGOs observing the UNFCCC negotiations. Axel, very much, uh, you're very much welcome. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be with you. And of course, I'm happy to see that the agricultural sector is now really engaging in the debate about climate finance in the broader sense and carbon markets in the more narrow sense. Um, Jotsna already mentioned the decisions in Glasgow, and I just want to summarize very quickly. We have Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which has two market-based approaches and one non-market-based approach. The two market-based approaches have different kinds of international regulation. Article 6.2, that is subject to guidance only, so it is not governed by an international body, but it allows countries to collaborate as they wish. There are certain principles and criteria, but uh, countries are relatively free how to engage in that bilateral or multilateral cooperation. And then we have Article 6.4, which is an international mechanism. So it's governed by a supervisory body. It is clearly a successor to what we saw under the Clean Development Mechanism, which already has been mentioned. What is also important is that some of these CDM activities, uh, they, they can transition if they are still having a running crediting period. And of course, also certain credits from CDM projects, if they come from activities registered after 2013, can also be used. That was very much contested in the negotiation, but I think the compromise was quite good. So what is the purpose of that Article 6? The one purpose is helping with NDCs. And the second purpose, and that's of course different from what we had under Kyoto, where we just had a mechanism that was a pure offsetting mechanism, the new approaches want to increase ambition beyond current targets. And of course, to achieve those uh, two targets, we need to ensure that there is no double counting of the emission credits. And therefore, we have what is called corresponding adjustment, a double bookkeeping approach. And under Article 6.2, so the bilateral or multilateral cooperation, which is not subject to international specific rules, we get so-called ITMOs, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. They have to formally satisfy certain criteria. They are the same as under the CBM. They need to be real. They need to be verified. Of course, verification usually is third party driven and they need to be additional. What is now very important is we have a process of authorization and that's more complex than the process we had in the past on the CDM because now there are three purposes for which this authorization can be given. And uh, we had already the mention of the voluntary markets playing an important role. And that's reflected here because we have the first purpose, which is classical. So you sell a credit that another country government can achieve its NDC. So that's as was the case under the CDM. We could have a second possible use, so-called international mitigation purposes. That is in practice only the Corsia system for international aviation. And the third one, of course, is really important because that is so-called other purposes, which means the voluntary carbon market. And it is absolutely important to understand that there is no direct regulation of the voluntary market under Article 6, but that the decisions that were made in Glasgow and that will now be elaborated, for example, by the supervisory body of Article 6.4, uh, they will affect the voluntary market. For example, under the Article 6.4, one can have emission credits that have the corresponding adjustment. So these have become ITMOs. And then there are emission credits that don't have a corresponding adjustment. So they don't become ITMOs. So of course, then the question is, for which activities and purposes can the second category be still be used? And here, just to show in a very simple graphic way how the corresponding adjustment is being undertaken. So of course you have the host country that actually still has some leeway to reach its uh, target of the NDC. And therefore in the second part of the graph, you see it sells the light blue portion of emissions. So it has to make a corresponding adjustment to increase the emission balance by that light blue amount. 
you see the arrow that's pointing upwards, but it's still fulfilling its NDC target. Whereas the buying country that wants to use the credit for the CDM, uh, for, sorry, for the NDC, uh, it, this country now ensures that it achieves the NDC target. Previously, it would have exceeded it. And that, of course, is now the really important question which of the mitigation actions that we will see in countries will generate credits for which purpose? So would one like to go through Article 6.4, which is the mechanism which uh, we will have a clear set of international rules, which will give the so-called Article 6.4 emission reductions? Or does one want to go through voluntary market standards? There are gold standards, there are other standards. Um, and those would give rise to a certified carbon credit under the voluntary standard. And that, of course, could now have different routes. It could remain in the voluntary sphere, but it could also try to get authorized by a government to become an ITMO. So one can see, one can start as a voluntary activity, but then become an activity under Article 6. And then, of course, there are the bi- or multilateral approaches for example, the Japanese joint crediting mechanism that generates Article 6.2 uh, credits. So uh, this mitigation outcome will become an ITMO. It will undergo the corresponding adjustment. And so you see that it is very important to have a clear understanding which credit goes into which market segment. So the ITMOs, of course, they can be used for the NPCs, for Corsia, for the voluntary market, whereas the voluntary credits, they, of course, as their name says, can still be used for the voluntary market domestically. They can also uh, generate a so-called finance claim. So if, for example, you want to support a host country with its NDC, then um, you can argue you've provided the finance for that. And of course, it can go towards the domestic NDC. So it is very important for a government, but also the activity developers to understand these different pathways and what could be an attractive approach, because one would, for example, expect that an ITMO fetch a higher price than a purely voluntary credit. So that's, of course, very important. And we see the voluntary credits, they have been increasingly used also towards mandatory domestic carbon pricing. I'm just giving the example of South Africa and Colombia. There may be further countries that will come up to use those. So you see, it's not black and white, no uh, distinct differentiation between the voluntary and the compliance systems, but there are intri interesting interactions between the two. Now, of course, uh, an important aspect are the issues regarding removals. We know that the agricultural sector, of course, very much is interested to generate removals, for example, soil carbon improvement that is removing uh, carbon from the atmosphere. And these removals can, of course, become really interesting. We see in the voluntary market, removals fetch a significant price premium. And now, of course, the question is, how does Article 6 deal with the removals? And there is a clear statement that the permanence of the removal is crucial. That if there are so-called reversals of the removal, so for example, you have soil carbon uh, generated and suddenly you have a farmer that does deep plowing and therefore the soil loses the carbon again, you have a reversal and that needs to be addressed. And the question is what means of addressing will be acceptable under Article 6? Under voluntary markets, for example, we have seen the buffer stock approaches that you retain 20, 40 or 60 percent of the credits in the buffer stock and that the buffer stock is released if there is a reversal. You could also have temporary credits. That was the solution under the CDM, but it was not very attractive because not many uh, companies or other actors wanted to buy the temporary credits. Or you may even have the so-called tonier accounting, which could give you a permanent credit that increases over time until a certain equivalence period is reached where you are equal to an emission reduction. 
Um, what is also specified is that the removals under Article 6.4 will have a 45 year crediting period. That's why they, of course, may become more attractive than the emission reductions that only have 15 years of crediting per period at maximum. Then there is also a big debate about the so-called emissions avoidance terminology. That is, in my view, a bit dangerous discussion. Some people mean that it uh, relates to keeping fossil fuel in the ground. Others related to red plus. Uh, avoidance of emissions from forest degradation that now needs to be addressed in the further negotiations. Just with regard to the timeline, how the Article 6 is going to evolve. So we have the supervisory body of Article 6.4, which started to operate this year. We hope that next year there will be the first authorizations on Article 6.2 and the first reports coming up. And then, of course, from 2024 onwards, we would have the full suite of reporting requirements being undertaken. What is now the specific relevance for agriculture and livestock? I've already mentioned it a bit, but I know what to become more specific. So, of course, soil carbon is really an upcoming topic. Um, we've not seen a lot of activity on that in the past, but now we see emergence of many different, also small standards in the voluntary markets. Of of course, soil carbon could have high mitigation benefits, but of course, there are significant challenges as well. So the permanent risk of nitrogen cost needs to be addressed. We sometimes have issues about the additionality. So would the activity not happen under normal circumstances? In Australia, there was a big debate about that. Baseline setting and monitoring reporting verification can be costly. And of course, we have the issue of the property rights for the emission credits. Who is the owner? Is it the farmer or is it the extension service that organizes the monitoring? So one needs to really be very careful about how to organize it. We see more and more methodologies under voluntary standards addressing soil carbon. And therefore I would expect that it gets uh, more and more also implementation on the ground. But uh, the challenges should not be underestimated. Then we have rice field irrigation that's now getting traction. There is a CDM methodology, there's a voluntary CM methodology, but the number of projects still remains small, but the theoretical potential is quite significant. What we also have, of course, is the livestock sector with a long history under the CDM. There were hundreds of projects with millions of credits being issued for uh, methane capture from the anaerobic digestion of animal waste, particularly pig and poultry sector. Huge program in Brazil, which was really uh, trailblazing. And of course, we have now an increased interest in feed supplement to reduce methane emission from ruminants. There are various methodologies that are coming up. Um, of course, there are then the connections also to the soil carbon. A big question that is of course relevant is now how the global methane pledge and the coverage of methane by NDCs will influence the coverage of that sector by the carbon markets. So to summarize, the Article 6 rules are a good framework for international carbon markets and their full operationalization by 2025 is likely. We have this close interaction between the compliance and the voluntary markets uh, through the issue of the double bookkeeping of the corresponding adjustment, especially under 6.4, where the government authorization is the crucial aspect whether credit becomes an ITMO or not. Then we have seen that the voluntary markets have been quite interested in credits from the sectors IFAT is interested in. Uh, we have, of course, the forestry sector that is dominating actually the voluntary market, but the livestock sector should not be underestimated. And we are getting some new approaches on soil sequestration, rice field, and so on, and even other agricultural elements. So I would think that the agricultural sector is currently just on the starting date of really getting fully involved in carbon markets. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Axel, for setting the scene and walking us through the main challenges and opportunities that we are facing right now um, on climate finance. Moving on, I'm now pleased to introduce you to our panel today. Moderating the panel is uh, Pierre-Yves Guedes, Senior Climate Finance Specialist at IFAD's Environment, Climate, Gender and Social Inclusion Division. With him, Ibu Laxmi Dewanti, National Focal Point for UNFCCC and Director General of Climate Change at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia. Andrew Howard, Senior Director of Climate Policy and Strategy at VERA. Karina Barrera, Undersecretary of Climate Change at the Ministry of Environment, Water and Ecological Transition of Ecuador. And Daniel Benefor, Agriculture Director of the Climate Change Unit at Ghana's Environmental Protection Agency. Pierre, over to you. Many thanks, Gladys, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks also, Axel, for this excellent uh, introduction. Now, uh, with our panelists, we will go into more, I would say, detail. Uh, all these uh, options which are offered to Paris uh, are being implemented differently by different countries. So we will hear, we will hear uh, today from Indonesia, Ecuador, Ghana, as well as Vera, how how they have progressed on, on implementing those different um, options. I will start with uh, with uh, with you, Karina, uh, regarding Ecuador. So we know that in, in March 2019, Ecuador has submitted its NDC to the convention. And, and this document obviously presents the, the unconditional targets as well as the conditional targets that the country uh, wants to reach with internal I mean international finance. And you have specific targets related to agriculture and forestry. Can you explain us, please, in the in the context of Ecuador specifically, what is your thinking when when you when you see so many options which have been open with the the, the Glasgow uh, the Glasgow Pact, uh, Article 6.2, Article 6.4, potentially a voluntary carbon market with the guidance from the government? Over to you. Many thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me in this important space. Uh, it's possible that I share a uh, some slides, maybe. Sure, one second, we'll give you. Okay. Go ahead, Karina. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, for Ecuador, it's important. Uh, I think that for every country, it's important to understand how are the emissions distributed in the inventory in order to know how to use the different mechanism of the Article 6. In the case of Ecuador, uh, we just emitted the 0.19% of the global emissions, and the most of the emissions comes from energy sector, and then um, land use sector, and agriculture. These are the main sources of emission in Ecuador. And how to, do, to use this, um, these, are, these are related to our NDC. The Ecuadorian NDC costs um, uh, almost $2,600 million, the implementation of the NDC. It means that we have to be very wise in order to finance our NDC. We have two, um, two sectors, uh, we, we divided our NDC one for uh, the energy industrial process management and agriculture, and another one for the land use. It is related just to the uh, reference period. Um, and with this, uh, we think that uh, we, we were thinking how to use this. And we have some approaches about that. First of all, we think that it's important that the, this mechanism, Article 6 mechanism, must safeguard the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. It's very important for us. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's important that uh, the de developed countries should um, uh, assume these, their own responsibilities and the mitigation outcomes cannot be translated to the uh, uh, developing countries. So, but we have to um, know how to use this financial mechanism. In our case, we think that the approaches could allow us to finance technologies that have a higher cost of di carbon dioxide abatement 
which cannot be financed by governments. Based on this, a differential cost can be established, which would allow maintaining a percentage of emissions in the national LNDCs, while also finance high impact initiatives that generate green jobs and provide environmental benefits in their territories. Even though the emission reduction would be counted in the inventory of another country. The main challenge as well as what we are going to focus our efforts on in Ecuador is to generate abatement curves for mitigation initiatives and also to determine the amount of emission that should remain in the country's NDC so that a cooperative uh, approaches can be applied, especially for non at fault sector, once the critical points of the late, latest climate change negotiations have been resolved. There are some, uh, I think that some challenges to solve now, but we think that this is a good possibility to, uh, to finance, especially the highest cost uh, technologies with the, the uh, 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 dioxide, carbon dioxide abatement cost, the higher cost of the carbon dioxide abatement. It's very important to know this information. Thanks. Many thanks. Many thanks, Karina. Um, uh, Daniel, uh, I will jump to you now. Uh, so you can, you can tell us a little bit about, about Ghana. Uh, Ghana published its, its NDC in November 2021. Uh, you have included in these documents uh, clear references to the Article 6.2 and to the need to mobilize finance, international finance. Uh, we know that environmental integrity, avoiding double accounting, etc., are extremely important uh, in Ghana. And we also know that we are, you have signed a, a bilateral agreement with Switzerland. Uh, I think it was in 2020 and then uh, a framework in 2021, which is a kind of very first collaboration between, between two countries, Switzerland and Ghana, to explore how to ever operationalize Article 6.2. Can you tell us a little bit more about this policy context in Ghana and how you, you are um, considering using those different tools, Article 6.2, 6.4, voluntary carbon market, to achieve your targets of the NDCs? Many thanks. All right. All right. Thank you very much um, uh, for the opportunity. Um, we have um, already um, <clears throat> in the NDCs um, um, indicated um, the <clears throat> the role of at, <clears throat> the role of the international carbon market in attaining the NDCs. So we have clearly articulated in the NDCs how we intend to use the, the carbon market to, to, to attain our long-term our long term, um, or medium-term outlook of emission reductions, which is around 64 million tons. Um, and besides that, we have also set out to do about three things to operationalize it, right? The first one is the creation, the creation of um, cooperative approaches through bilateral negotiations. So we spent the couple of years, about two or three years, to create three cooperative approaches. The first one is what you refer to. Two more with the Sweden government and the, and the Singaporean government is ongoing, right? And that is in the spirit of the, the, the requirements under, under the 6-2. Beside that, we are also um, very much involved in establishing a national arrangement, a national enabling arrangement. And that framework was prepared last year, but we have graciously received a political endorsement just last week from the, from the national cabinet. So the, the, the national framework, which is a step further to operationalizing the cooperative approaches has not received a political endorsement just last week. And we are now in the process of converting the framework into a legal document. So the framework really contains the key elements for Article 64, 62, and potentially the voluntary carbon market. And just zooming in on the 6.2, it, it covers clearly the procedures for authorization, when to authorize, how to authorize, the scope of authorization, the duration of authorization, the eligible uh, activities that are, 
that we can authorize or not authorize. And the interlinkages between 6264 and the voluntary market are all clearly in the, uh, covered in, in that document. Last but not least, it's also about um, um, the institutional arrangement, the governance structures have also been covered in the framework as well. The last one is also that we are currently piloting a couple of projects and one of it was what was mentioned earlier on, on RISE. So we are working on alternate, alternate working and drawing projects right now as a pilot and a, a cook stove program already. They are quite advanced in terms of, we are aiming at becoming the first ever um, Article 6.2 projects in the country. Many thanks, Daniel. It's a pity that we only have five minutes to give you for, for these questions. I yeah. think it deserves an entire an entire session. Uh, Diri Bulaksmi, I would like to 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 jump to Indonesia now. Indonesia is one of, one of the richest uh, country in terms of carbon, uh, and and you have recently uh, submitted an enhanced NDC. Uh, congratulations for that. I think this was last month. Um, and you have also released quite recently a, a, a new carbon law, which gives some direction uh, to national entities and the private sector, I guess, about how to how to ensure environmental integrity, of, uh, avoidable accounting, etc. Could you please tell us a little bit more of, of this approach of Indonesia relating those different articles, please? Many thanks. Thank you for the uh, questions, as well as I also would like to thank to Axel for the excellent introductions to this uh, talk. Uh, yeah, and, and thank you for acknowledging uh, Indonesia Enhanced NDC. Indonesia as an NDC, I mean, within the Enhanced NDC, we are increasing our target uh, for the unconditional scenario from 29% to 31.89%. Uh, uh, and for the conditional target, we increase from uh, 41 to 43.2% uh, by 2030. Um, and this enhanced NDC is basically a transition toward Indonesia's second NDC, which will be aligned with our long-term strategy for low carbon and climate resilience strategy in 2050 with a vision to achieve the Indonesian net zero emission by 2060 or, or sooner. And to implement this, of course, uh, Indonesia, uh, as a consequence, Indonesia need to develop strategy, including the financial mechanisms and the way to support the achieving of the NEC. The, uh, uh, the new uh, carbon pricing regulations, it is the presidential regulation number 90, uh, 8 of 2021 uh, stimulated the uh, implement the development and implementations of a set of uh, carbon pricing mechanisms. This regulation is part of our commitment in ensuring successful of NDC implementation through mobilizations of climate finance and innovative financing. For your information, there are four strategy of Indonesia in the context of environmental protection as well as climate finance namely strengthening fiscal policy, including the climate budget tagging. The second is making environment and climate actions become more attractive to investors. Uh, the third strategy is to enhance access to the global sources. Uh, and the uh, last strategy is to develop and implement various innovative financial mechanism and instrument, such as green bond, green Islamic sukuk, blended finance, we are also establishing Indonesia Environment Fund. And the last uh, regulation is the uh, development of economic instrument, including the carbon pricing. So in light of this, the carbon market and carbon pricing, we believe it must be part of the effort in addressing the climate uh, issues, especially in enhancing our NDC's target and to ensure the achievement of this uh, NDC target. And within the, uh, the regulations, the implementation of carbon pricing to achieve nationally determined contributions target, as well as to control over greenhouse gas emission in the national development, we are uh, promoting a four scheme. The first scheme is carbon trading. It's including the cap and trade, 
and carbon uh, offset. The second mechanism is the result-based payment. The third is levy on carbon. And the fourth could be a combination of the uh, uh, mentioned uh, scheme. So meaning that the carbon pricing uh, mechanism is in, in Indonesia, it's not only referring or regarding uh, to the Article 6, but we also include Article 5 in this context, RDD Plus, as a part of the, our economic, uh, uh, economic instrument uh, policies, uh, especially the carbon pricing. Why we introduce the four mechanism? Because we know that within our NDC, we have various uh, sectors. We have energy sector, we have folu sector, we have agriculture, we have waste, we have um, uh, industrial process and product use. And we also still exercising another sectors to be part of our second NDC later, including the uh, blue carbon. So having the four mechanism, meaning that we provide options to sectors. According to the regulations, which mechanism that they wish to implement for their sector or subsector in achieving their NDC is really uh, uh, the mandate it's given to the line ministers and uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry as the national focal point in this context is the one who set up the MRV guidelines as well as the uh, national registry system that now become or serve as a carbon registry uh, as a national carbon registry as well. So we believe that by giving options to sector, they have more flexibility and be able to tailor the most uh, suitable mechanism for their own purposes. Because we know that the challenges among sectors is different from one to another, uh, as well as the, uh, the level of engagement of stakeholders, uh, the characteristic of the sites, as well as the, uh, uh, the option that they're having in their sector or subsector, um, meaning um, I mean, making their uh, flexible in implementing one or two uh, carbon pricing mechanism for their purposes. Thank you. M many thanks, Ibu Laksmi. I think that this again would deserve an entire day to, to have enough time to go into the substance. Uh, Andrew, I think I will end with you the first round of questions. So you are representing VERA, uh, the, the major uh, voluntary carbon <coughs> standard and, and also leader on, on nature-based solution. Um, and you know very well uh, how import, uh, Article 6 is important to increase ambition. We have heard that from all the countries here, all the colleagues here today. Uh, to reduce the cost of mitigation action and channel more resources, including from the private sector. And we know that the private sector uh, likes to have uh, visibility, predictability, et cetera, and that a rapid transition from CDM to Article 6.4 is, is very important. So could you tell it, could, could you tell us a little bit from your perspective um, what, what you see from the, the supply side of, let's say, credits and the demand side, the, the buyers themselves? Uh, the, have you, what, what type of evolution have you seen? Have you seen since Glasgow uh, in, ta in type of trend, uh, for instance, <clears throat> between buyers or sellers and the use of the different mechanisms? Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Um, could I share some slides as well, please? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Andrew, you should be able now. Okay. <clears throat> right, can you see these? Yes, if we could uh, zoom in, so yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, there's been a lot which has been happening since Glasgow, it is true. Um, I, I think for us, to be honest, there's been a, in terms of the voluntary market, the growth has been really um, going very fast for the last couple of years. So that predates Glasgow. You could say that some of it was in, in anticipation of what was going to happen in Glasgow on, on Article 6. But really, the voluntary market has been um, progressing um, a, a lot in the last few years. Um, and it's been up and down 
uh, like that over the last 15 years or so, but the growth that we're seeing is really quite unprecedented. Um, first, a couple of words about Vera. If you don't know Vera already, Vera is the name of the organization. Our flagship standard is the Verified Carbon Standard, uh, which is the one that we operate in the carbon space. Um, but we do have other standards as well in, um, for jurisdictional red, which is a part of VCS, uh, and also um, the Sustainable Development Verified Impact Standard, SD Vista, and Climate Community and Biodiversity Standards, CCB. Um, so in the carbon space, uh, the VCS program is around three quarters currently of, of the voluntary market. Uh, so And there are increasingly overtures from here into uh, into compliance markets as well. So you can see here a, a graph of what's happened in the um, the last 15 years or so, a decade and a half. You can see the major spike there around 2012 was the Kyoto Protocol with the CDM. So the CDM is in blue here. But what you can see more recently is the um, is the pace of the development, and in, that is very much driven by the voluntary. Um, carbon market. So that that peaking that we see in the last years, that's being driven by the voluntary market and the purple is primarily uh, Bearer's VCS program. So it is quite a significant program. It is expected to grow uh, a lot from here up to um, 1,500 to 2,000 megatons in 2030 and some estimates going up to 13,000 megatons in 2050. So that is really enormous growth that we have in front of us as well. I just wanted to give a few words in case you don't know it on the project cycle that we have in, this does get very complex, so I'm not going to make it complex, um, but in broad terms, we have a registration process where projects come forward um, they are subject to a third party validation process in order to make sure they meet the standards. And then we do our own checks as well, our own reviews before registering the projects. And once projects are registered, then they go into a cycle of um, implementation and monitoring and verification of the monitored results, uh, and then issuing the actual uh, credits into the, the Vera registry. So all the um, verification here is third party independent um, and this is the, as I say, it gets much more complex than this, but this is the, the broad process that, that we run. So in terms of um, developments that we're seeing right now, um, I wanted to mention three. And firstly, the host countries, the role of host countries is changing enormously as we go forward. Um, in, in the voluntary market, certainly in the past, um, the role of the host country was very often uh, to not raise any objections. And um, there, uh, in many cases, countries didn't even know that there were voluntary projects uh, happening on their territory. That is really changing as we go forward. The Paris Agreement puts the responsibility for a country's emissions squarely on the shoulders of the country. Um, and therefore, host countries are growing uh, very interested in not only keeping an eye on what's happening with the voluntary market, but also being able to actively engage with it and to be able to encourage it. And uh, what we see here is that countries are taking different approaches, but um, the countries very much have a role in building up the market confidence and, and making their countries attractive to investors um, on the voluntary market. Um, the, uh, we generally identify three key roles that host countries have in this regard. Uh, one is a strategic role, which is essentially the country working out what its NDC means um, and identifying from that uh, what its needs for uh, international finance are and which kinds of international finance are going to be most suitable for the country. So, you know, the, the choice there between a compliance-oriented market um, or a voluntary market source, or indeed climate finance as different sources. So these do have different implications for the for the accounting of mitigation outcomes, um, and countries generally move through that process in order to ensure as well that uh, they uh, are able at the end of the NDC period to actually demonstrate that they have met their NDC. So it is important um, for many countries that they don't 
give away too many of the emission reductions and they are careful uh, as to, to what they're giving away. And that ties in very much to the next part on project guidance. Uh, this is where a host country can have a role in actually giving guidance to project developers and to the voluntary market generally uh, in a similar way to uh, the way that it would give guidance through its collaboration with another country under an Article 6.2 um, framework. It's where you've got a bilateral agreement in place but between two governments. So here, um, what's very important is that the host country is able to identify what are the priority sectors or activities where it really needs to have the finance flow in from the voluntary carbon market. And, um, and there, it's also important for the country to tie this into its own priorities for sustainable development. So it's very clear about what it's actually allowing into the country. And in the countries will of, often set up approval processes or in the Article 6 context uh, where corresponding adjustments are necessary, um, where they will also put in place authorization processes to enable that um, uh, in line with what Michael, um, Axel was talking about before. The last one here, project oversight, this is important as well, uh, largely in terms of being able to track what is actually happening during the implementation of projects. So um, we can see that there, there are countries which are putting in place uh, databases and tracking systems in order to, to be able to see how much mitigation is happening, which projects are occurring, and what sort of funding is, is happening for those projects. So that's a very key feature that we do see growing at the moment, and we expect that to the host country engagement in the voluntary capital market to, to expand a lot in the next years. The uh, voluntary market is also undergoing work on its integrity. Um, I think there's there are different views as to how much integrity there is within the voluntary market or even within compliance market systems. Um, you've had the same debates with the CDM as you also have sometimes with the voluntary market where it's uh, there's a need to demonstrate that there is an integrity built into the system, an environmental integrity. And what that really means is that the, uh, the emission reduction has really occurred and the number uh, of emission reduction credits that uh, a company is able to access uh, is does indeed correspond to the real reduction that's happening in practice. <clears throat> there are two major uh, integrity initiatives underway at the moment. One is on the supply side and the other is on the demand side. On the supply side is the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market. This has grown out of the task force for scaling the voluntary carbon market, which happened last year. Uh, so this is a, a new council. Um, it's already been active uh, this year in particular. Uh, their motto is to build integrity and scale will follow. Um, so it is very much about ensuring environmental integrity and with that extra confidence for the market, um, the, the demand will, will be mobilized. Um, they are currently in the process of developing um, something called the core carbon principles. Those principles are actually quite simple. Um, what is more complex is the assessment framework, which is also being developed against that. And the intention is, uh, and I think this is a, something beginning next year, is that all of the um, carbon crediting programs would be uh, subjected to an assessment of against these core carbon principles. And you can see that they, they address a lot of the key attributes that are quite familiar. If you're familiar with uh, carbon markets around, in particular, additionality and baselines and how permanence is assured, double counting, setting up registries with transparency, um, verification systems, and also ensuring that uh, sustainable development is in, engaged in that. So this is very much about ensuring the quality of the credits. And the intention is that by applying this assessment to all of the crediting programs that the bar will be raised higher across the entire voluntary market. On the corporate uh, demand side, uh, we have the, the BCMI, the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative. And this is looking at the claims that companies are able to make when they purchase credits. Um, and this is very much tied into the action that they are taking generally on reducing their emissions. So um, generally speaking, the BCMI follows the mitigation hierarchy, which is where the companies uh, are prioritizing their own 
reductions, that's reductions in emissions from their own operations, scope one and scope two in the, in the lingo, um, but also uh, making progress on reducing emissions in what's called scope three, which is the uh, emissions which are attributable to that company, but are actually emitted by someone else, either from upstream suppliers or downstream um, consumers of the products. So this is, um, the VCMI very much follows that. Um, it um, puts requirements in place that companies, if they wish to make claims under VCMI, that they are putting themselves, um, putting forward targets, long-term targets, and also interim targets on their emissions, and are actually um, heading towards uh, reaching a net zero position. And there are limitations in this context about how much a corporate can actually use uh, credits for in this context. So this is all trying to be laid out in the VCMI. Um, I've put the website links there. Both initiatives have just been through um, quite, um, quite significant public consultation processes. So both initiatives are currently trying to digest what's been received. The last point I wanted to make is uh, um, something which is uh, often spoken about as a convergence of compliance and voluntary markets. And my sense is that when people talk about the compliance of these two markets, it's not often not very clear on what level the compliance is or the convergence is really being spoken about. Um, but generally speaking, we, we are seeing, and we will increasingly see this in the future, that there is uh, a blurring of lines between these markets, which used to be held very separately. Compliance markets is really referring to a regulatory demand. So if a company uh, has an obligation put in place by its government um, through a carbon tax or through an emissions trading system, uh, then they are uh, incentivized that way to demand carbon credits in order to help them meet that regulatory requirement, as opposed to the voluntary market, which is really where companies are creating their own targets um, on a voluntary basis and, and sometimes using credits towards those. Um, we are expecting we, well, we already have a lot of convergence in the fact, um, in the sense that the the programs which actually supply those credits that do all the verification for the generation of those credits, um, they increasingly supply both compliance and voluntary markets. So Vera's VCS program, for example, is used by government programs and it's also used by voluntary programs. So you already have a harmonization in the standard um, across um, these uh, these different markets. The, um, the integration of independent crediting programs into Article 6.2 is a um, big question for, um, for the future. You know, which countries will um, recognize different independent standards such as VERA's um, as they put in place their Article 6.2 programs. Um, there's an, a number of different areas where we do expect to see a lot of um, the, the principles that were established through Glasgow's Article 6 rules uh, also reflected into the voluntary market. So you can see these on the left. Um, the the Article 6.4 process, which Axel referred to earlier, has set uh, particular crediting periods, which are much shorter than is the um, the case currently on the voluntary market, or was on the case for the CDM. Um, so we are currently considering whether we should also be reducing the crediting period length. Um, there's going to be big challenges in the future um, to ensure that we're keeping a very close eye on what changes in domestic climate policy and in NDCs will. Are taking place because this will have a big impact on the way that we assess additionality of projects. Uh, there's also requirements for not locking in emission technologies, high emitting technologies um, within projects. So there's a preference for moving away from those technologies altogether and uh, a preference for greater use of performance based baseline setting. Uh, so that's where there's more opportunity for op updating the, the baselines and making sure that the baselines are uh, more in tune with a, a more aggressive autonomous increase in the in the efficiency um, and therefore the reductions in emissions which will occur over time. 
So um, those are, I think, key developments that we're going to be seeing in the future. Um, the ones on the right-hand side are a little more controversial, and there's less consensus as to whether these should be picked up uh, in the voluntary market. Um, I think the call I would make on these is that they're probably unlikely to be made mandatory, but there may be voluntary ways of being able to uh, increase the amount of accounting adjustments, that's Article 6 accounting within the voluntary market, and um, other ways of increasing um, the way that um, finance is provided into adaptation and other ways of, of making sure there's stronger emission reductions occurring through the market. So yes, those are, um, there's a lot going on in the voluntary market space. Uh, those are some of the things, um, these are, as I say, they predate Glasgow as well, but they are increasing with their intensity now. Andrew, many, many thanks. Uh, I think you were really beyond, beyond expectations and, and you gave a flavor also of the level of complexity that countries have to navigate as well as, as carbon standards and, and the buyers uh, interested in those. Uh, different options. So many thanks for that. Uh, before starting the second round of question, which will take uh, roughly 15 minutes, I, I want to recall the audience that you can ask your questions on the Q&A box. Uh, so please do so as soon as you have questions, obviously. Um, we will take a second round of questions now. Uh, no, sorry. We will ask the panelists to respond to a, a second round of questions. And then in 15 minutes, uh, we will respond to the questions in the Q&A &A box. Many thanks. So the second uh, round of question for our panelists is the following. Because uh, of the mandate of IFAD, basically, which is focused on, on agriculture and, and rural livelihood, uh, we have a, a specific interest in understanding if uh, in your different countries or entities, uh, Andrew for Vera, uh, you, 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 you think about treating emission reduction or, or capture generated from agriculture or agriculture or forestry and other land use differently uh, from, from emission, gener uh, emission reduction generated by the sector of energy or transportation, for instance. And, uh, and if it is the case, then why are you planning of using those emission reduction differently? And, and for which specific tool, let's say, uh, Article 6264 Voluntary Carbon Market or your own NDC. Uh, those emission reductions are known to be very cost effective. Uh, those emission reductions also named sometimes nature based solution are known uh, to come with a lot of co-benefits related to biodiversity protection, forest protection, uh, water resources, etc. Uh, there are also some technicalities that Axel mentioned in, the, in his first introduction on measuring uh, emissions or capture in soil carbon. Uh, so taking into, a, uh, into account all those elements, um, I would like to hear from, from Karina, Daniel, Igulaksmi and, and Andrew, uh, what is your view regarding this specific uh, emission reduction from AFOLU? Karina, please. Thank you, Pierre. In the case of Ecuador, uh, it's very clear the difference because of the constitution of Ecuador. Ecuador has, uh, was the first country in the world to include the rights of nature in their constitution. So uh, it implies uh, specific actions. For example, um, the constitution establishes the non-appropriation of environmental services and gives the state the responsibility to regulate their use in an fair and equitable manner. So um, this is a different um, chain, um, pathway for Ecuador this, uh, since the constitution period. Uh, and then our NDC has two, uh, as I mentioned before, we have the transport, uh, uh, energy, uh, industrial process and management in one NDC with a specific uh, reference level related to the uh, 2010. Uh, and then uh, the NDC related to a follow or nature-based solutions has other period of reference from 20 to 28. And we have a different treatment in the case of a follow NDC is fully management under red plus, uh, red plus focus. And this, uh, 
it is important because uh, we have been working under uh, uh, reducing the payment by results with a non-marking approach, which is related or is very related to Article 5 and to Article 6.8 6 with the uh, Paris Agreement. It's a different way to see. And Ecuador was the second country in the world to reach the uh, payment by results by the GCF. And then we are one of the pioneers uh, working with the Red Early Movers program financed by Norway and Germany. We have implemented with these resources our Red Plus scheme. Uh, Red Plus for Ecuador, uh, it, it, is, it has been working for 12 years and with the contribution of uh, indigenous people and local communities and in a very participative way. It is very important because this is a differentiator. We have a um, national focus, not just a local a jurisdictional focus like, like other countries. Uh, we don't have a leak, leak, leakage, uh, emissions leakage uh, under this uh, framework. And then uh, we have a good traceability. The generation of uh, environmental and social co-benefits is very demonstrable and the sharing benefits too. So Ecuador has a high integrity system. Now, how to engage? Uh, we, we have addressing some challenges in our scheme. If on the, on the one, in one hand, um, how to engage the private sector. Now we are go, working uh, with the LEF coalition in order to involve a um, voluntary market under our own um, rules with no transference of emissions and using uh, the credits related to reduction and uh, avoided emissions that it, it was mentioned before. It is a, dif a difficult concept, but we are using this concept and reduction, reducing and uh, creating new stocks, carbon stocks. Uh, it means that uh, we are working under an non market approach, but involving to the um, private sector and the voluntary market. And we are working on another level too. We are creating a on a specific on a national uh, compensation over offsetting scheme with our uh, program carbon uh, Ecuador Carbono Cero that it is a, a, a carbon footprint program and uh, this is a, a specific way to involve the carbon neutrality of the local enterprises and of the uh, international enterprises too. We are uh, one of the, our main challenges is to choose the right the standards maybe Vera, maybe Plan Vivo, uh, Ser Carbono, or other standards in order to include uh, the, uh, the soil carbon and agroforestry uh, carbon and the forest carbon too. We are working on this direction. Maybe we are not so clear in how to go or to move forward uh, to Article 6.2 with a follow sector or 6.4 for the future, but we are starting to create the, the scheme, the local governance, the standards, the rules, and to, to enhance and to improve the, we, our active, we know, we, we really believe that the red class in Ecuador is the, can create a very high integrity carbon offsetting scheme. Thanks. M many thanks, Karina. Um, I don't see Daniel on the on the participants now. So Ibu Laxmi, if you don't mind, I will jump to you directly for the same question. Many thanks. Yeah, thank you, Pierre, for for the questions. Um, yeah, for for Indonesia, as I mentioned before, we believe that there is no one fit for for all, including the uh, instrument or mechanism for carbon pricing for dealing, dealing with, with one specific uh, sector. And uh, for Indonesia, we even uh, separate the uh, A at the agriculture and the, uh, the, foro, the forest and land other use. For the FOLU, uh, for example, uh, a part of our uh, NDC roadmap, both for mitigation and adaptation, 
for the Polo Netsing, we have a strategic operational and uh, document, so called Polo Netsing 2030. Uh, well, it's uh, it showed that Indonesia would like to have the Netsing uh, carbon for Polo sector by 2030. So under the, this specific uh, operational uh, strategic, we design uh, various um, mechanisms for incentive as well as for the financing, including the carbon pricing. REDD, I mean, it's similar to what Karina meant, uh, uh, explained for the Ecuador. Indonesia was also uh, have the, the similar approach toward the REDD plus. And we, I mean, Indonesia is the received the biggest uh, result based payment from, from Green uh, Climate Fund and other mechanism under the REDD plus. So we still uh, regard the uh, Article 5 will be uh, uh, apply for the forest sector as well as for agriculture. But we also open for another market uh, type of uh, instrument under Article, Article 6 including for the forest and the agriculture sectors. The challenge is the, uh, to have the, uh, uh, how, how to put the price right, because we would like to have the carbon pricing for Indonesian forests as well as for other land use uh, based uh, activities, it's a so-called premium. So we need to also include the non-carbon benefit uh, price for our uh, biological diversity and other econo uh, and economic uh, or ecosystem services from, from that sector. So yes, of course, we need to treat uh, different sectors with different approaches, with different instrument, because each individual sector do have their own challenges and there is no one fit uh, for all type of approach, including uh, uh, the, uh, Article 6 or Article 5 or other uh, carbon pricing mechanisms. Thank you. Many thanks, Ibu Laksmi. Um, Andrew, over to you for the same question, please. Yes, thanks, Pierre. Uh, the question for Vera is, of course, a little bit different from uh, the, the way the countries would respond to this. Um, I, from the perspective of independent programs like ourselves, we don't really make a distinction between uh, reduction projects and removal projects. Uh, of course, there are many technical differences which need to be taken into account, but in terms of uh, the way we see the prioritization of the uh, of these two different types of projects, um, we do think that they are both equally important. Um, I think obviously in the longer term, as we get closer towards net zero and as we actually hit a net zero emissions um, status, we're never actually going to fully eliminate um, all emissions. So there will be a need to compensate for um, those emissions which are still occurring, those hard to abate or those residual emissions. And uh, we will need removal projects for that. So that is very clear that what we'll need at that point are removal projects and, and not reduction process projects. Um, but uh, we are still unfortunately quite a long way from that point. And right now it is as important to be reducing emissions uh, as it is to make a start on removing emissions as well. That's certainly uh, the, the, the way that we treat this issue. And of course the um, the way that our standard is set up uh, caters then for both types of um, activities. Um, but it is very important to be able to make the reductions in emissions, otherwise we're going to um, extend um, a long way into the future the, the amount of um, the removals that we'll need to make. Um, I, th I think within that context, we have methodologies which are ad addressing many different kinds of production projects, and we also have uh, in the removal space, we have methodologies which are uh, addressing those as well. So um, very uh, prominent methodologies that we have on this is for improved agricultural land management. Uh, so that's uh, a, a big area, which is, uh, so that's looking at reductions in soil organic uh, carbon removals from, um, from agricultural land management activities. Um, also enteric methane emissions, so that's changing the feed which is given to ruminants. 
uh, and also in the area of afforestation and reforestation and, and regeneration, revegetation projects as well. Many thanks, Andrew. So this ends the, the round of questions that we had for you, panelists. Uh, and now we will start the question from the audience. Uh, as of now, I have seen two questions only. So feel free, please feel free to add uh, any more questions you have in mind in the, in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of, of your screen. And, Pierre. Uh, yes. Sorry, Pierre. Could I remind all the speakers, including our um, Associate Vice President, to please turn on their cameras during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. And uh, then I will start with the first question, which I guess, Andrew, is going to be for you. Uh, who bears the initial cost of voluntary carbon markets and developing database uh, and developing database and uh, level of private sector engagement we are expecting? So quite broad questions in reality. Would you like me to repeat or is it OK? Um, and maybe I can also directly come in because I yeah, had uh, registered my interest to answer that question. Oh. So, of course, the costs uh, accrue on different levels. There are costs of the standard operators. Of course, uh, Vera, for example, is a huge outfit. It needs to pay its staff members, so it will collect fees from those who run projects through the registry. And then, of course, there is a question of uh, what are the regulatory costs. We have various governments that have now been engaged in looking at the voluntary market. For example, Indonesia has told some project owners that they can no longer export credits until further notice. So, of course, these costs, they are also, they accrue to the governments. And then, of course, those who develop activities, they need to collect the data for uh, calculating the baseline, doing the MRV, these costs they need to carry themselves. So there are various layers of costs uh, that accrue to different actors. Many thanks, Axel. Andrew, anything you would like to complement or is it okay? Um, no, I think it's already um, <laughs> very well, helpful. Well answered. I think the one thing that I would highlight is um, which I wouldn't regard as cost directly, but as an investment, it is the private sector which is then coming forward under these programs and is making the investments uh, in in the countries in, into the host countries. So that I think is the the major uh, cost or the major investment which is involved. Many thanks. The second question uh, we, we received was uh, for Daniel, but da Daniel is not here anymore. I see that he has some connection issues. Uh, so I will invite the, the panelists and Axel to, to jump in if they want to respond to this one. Someone was indicating that he has been working with rice farmers in Tanzania and through Africa to adopt warehouse receipt schemes to make sure smallholders can receive fair prices. The point here is how to, en to en how to encourage farmers to use rice husks to produce energy under carbon finance guidelines and to receive credits for this transformation. Yeah, someone... as, as written in my answer, rice husk projects have been very strongly engaged in, in India under the CDM. Uh, so I think there was probably 50 of those uh, power plants ranging from 2, 3 to 15 megawatt. Uh, the challenge, of course, uh, was that, yeah, the technology is not straightforward. So one needs to have good quality boilers because the rice husk is abrasive and so on. So it needed sufficient technical understanding to actually run these power plants in a long-term sustainable manner. Excellent. Many thanks, Axel. Uh, Pierre, just very quickly, um, Karina must leave because she has um, a ministry engagement. Um, if you need her to do any last remarks before she goes, please. Karina, any last word before leaving us? Oh, thank you. I think that the discussion is very rich. In, uh, it's very rich to know, to understand what is the point of view that, of the countries. Um, 
uh, of the ex experts. I think that we all, all of us are uh, transitist in this mechanism and we are learning how to implement this. Uh, thank you for having me in this space and see you soon. Many thanks, Karina. Uh, and many thanks for your time today. It was super interesting to be continued. I will, ra I will raise a, a third question that I that just appeared in the in the chat box, in the Q&A box, sorry. Uh, so how does the climate financing and carbon cost translate to mitigating the challenges of smallholder farmers facing climate change effect living in rural villages in Nigeria? So who is interested to pick up this one? Well, I could give an example. Of course, I understand the question not to only cover mitigation, but also adaptation, climate change impacts. So there is, uh, well, in the broader sense of climate finance, there's now an interesting mechanism, which is called adaptation benefits mechanism. It's run by the African Development Bank, and it wants to mobilize private funding for adaptation benefits. And the approaches used to actually calculate the adaptation benefits are derived from those approaches we've been using under the carbon markets mitigation. Actually, I'm serving there as the vice president of the methodology panel on this adaptation benefits mechanism. And we received some really interesting methodology submissions. So one was on storage facilities. So of course, if you have climate change, if you have a uh, hotter temperature, then your uh, harvest may rot more quickly uh, or um, the protection against uh, uh, flash flooding. There is a methodology that has been submitted for portable flood defenses. Uh, so there is quite some interesting action on the ground. Um, of course, yeah, the mechanism is still in a flat state and we need more interest from private sector but also from donors to actually underwrite uh, the, uh, the methodology work but yeah um, and of course carbon markets can contribute uh, by to increase for example resilience in the context of these cookstove projects and Wes mentioned them um, if you reduce the pressure on um, yeah wood uh, vegetation in arid areas you will be more resilient so many possibilities blending various sources of finance. Many thanks, Axel. I was about to say, I don't see additional questions, but one just come, come up here. And I think it is going to be the last one uh, before giving the floor to all of you for final remarks and, and then Joe to close the, the session. How do you protect the huge investments from the private sector, for instance, and other financiers to promote continued appetite for such stakeholders who would like to get on board in the future. Uh, shall I open the, with this one? Um, so one of the things that we're very careful uh, within our standard um, is that we don't apply any well, we, in, we try to ensure that the rules that apply to projects are, are very stable. So they do, of course, change over time. They do improve over time, but they remain very stable. And I, I think the same principle needs to be applied by countries as well, particularly in the kind of um, the change and the dynamism that they're going through with their own climate policy. Um, so it is important, I think, to be able to um, clarify the procedures which would apply to um, market players, whether it's in a compliance market or a voluntary market, um, to make it very, um, to make approval processes and authorization processes very clear and easy to work with, um, to make sure that that remains stable. Um, I, I think that would go a long way to in improving the security that projects have in, in coming into countries. Many thanks. Excellent, Andrew. So. Colleagues, Gladys, I think I'm going to give you back the floor now uh, to guide us to the ending of the session. Thank you so much, Pierre. Um, actually, we have some uh, a couple of minutes, uh, so I would like to give the floor back to Joe, if that's Associate Vice President, for um, a last remark and um, the message that she would like us all to take back home. Thank you. Over to you, Joe. Thank you so much, Gladys. Actually, I, I, I was trying to also put questions in the 
uh, Q&A for, but uh, because I'm a host or a panelist, I think I'm not allowed to put questions there. But in any case, I'm hoping very much that at COP27, we'll get to discuss some of this. I, I do want to say that uh, this was perhaps one of the most exciting um, innovation talks um, that I've been to. And this is in no small part, um, a huge amount of credit to, of course, Gladys and uh, Pierre, but also the fantastic to, uh, experts and the panelists that we have today. And I really do want to recognize Axel, um, who I know from various other incarnations that I know that he's had over time, um, Andrew and our country representatives from um, Ecuador and Ghana and um, Ecuador, Ghana and Indonesia. And of course, Andrew as well from Vera. So really appreciate that. I, I think the what came out for me very strongly was that clearly um, this is a very dynamic space from CDM. Um, um, again, this space has uh, evolved extremely quickly. And unlike CDM, which is now sunsetting, uh, clearly, carbon markets are here to stay. And while there are challenges in terms of us thinking about carbon pricing, how we might think about verification, how we might think about uh, also involving, and that was also another question that I had, you know, where can international organizations come in, not just on the enabling side, and I, and I recognize that international organizations can have a very nice role to play in terms of policies, in terms of capacity building, in terms of awareness creation, um, um, et cetera. I think in terms of buying and selling um, you know, of carbon credits and how we could help to support also some of the redistribution questions that have been also posed in the q and I think it becomes really useful to also put some of the onus of this entire and very evol very fast evolving space on international organizations, because of course it's a global good. I really also appreciated the fact that, um, and Axel made this point about um, adaptation benefits mechanism. Um, all, um, there, there is an evolving, one of the key things that we see within EFAD is that more than 90% of our overall portfolio actually is focused on adaptation, but we've also been able to measure using the iGleam as well as the exact tools to under, we've been able to measure, um, we've been able to measure the overall carbon intensity or the carbon emissions, I beg your pardon, of our uh, projects and our investments. And I first got uh, learning from there is that we're actually carbon negative. Um, and that's very exciting for us uh, because given our overall focus on adaptation, we see the huge role of Co of co-benefits accruing from both adaptation as well as mitigation uh, action and investments. And this is something, for example, the, and I'm an uh, expert reviewer also on the adaptation gap report that is like uh, going to come out very soon. Uh, that is something that is really important for us to see as to how we can bring the two sorts of potential markets together, both of which remain very much in the voluntary slash compliance domain currently and the, where we are likely to see a huge amount of action in terms of uh, work by organizations that are looking, you know, like, such as Vera, but also the national frameworks. I think they, just to sort of end, uh, clearly a key role for IFAD is to try and see as to how we can work with countries to first both enable the uh, the fact that their uh, that the commitments with respect to that country commitments in NDCs are aligned also with their needs with respect to and their expressed desire to work on um, activities related to Article six point two six point four also six point eight and Article five and and I think that's first um, I think first and foremost a call for action to ourselves as EFAD that it is really clearly important that we start to, that we continue to and intensify our work in that area, while also taking leadership and ownership for many of the questions that we are facing with respect to core benefits, loss and damage, et cetera, that I know that we'd also be get to discuss at COP. I think the second thing that came out to me quite starkly is the role of the private sector. And it was one of the questions that I was 
also um, keen to hear a lot of the panelists speak about. One, uh, uh, clearly the private sector has a really important role here, um, but uh, what is important is to try and see as to how we can bridge that public-private gap, which seems to uh, also be um, coming out quite starkly in the context of um, voluntary markets and the fact that currently the government to government and government to private, well, a large part of this seems to be government to government, but also government to private. So it is important that we continue to see the private sector as a really important uh, role player in this space. And at IFAD, again, we are really committed um, to seeing that go forward. And then the last comment I had was really in um, trying to see as to how we can, um, given the given the momentum in this space, in this international space, we can also promote technologies that can help us uh, to ensure some of the transformations that are predicted within uh, the voluntary and the uh, voluntary as well as in the compliance markets that we are seeing. But I do want to finish here and thank very thank very much the organizers and Gladys and Gladys's entire team, but also Pierre as well as our panelists for this fantastic talk. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe, for highlighting the most uh, relevant aspects of today's dialogue. And thank you so much also for your words of appreciation. A reminder to our audience that uh, IFAD will be hosting a pavilion at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. We look forward to welcoming you at all of our events and uh, to continue the dialogue um, led by our uh, strategy and knowledge management department. Um, I would like to thank also our speakers and our team behind the scenes, Carmela Lopez, John Lert, Alessandra Labocheta, and Dilva Terzano for their great work. And with a special thanks to our speakers, of course, and to Pierre Ifa Guedes and his team for their contributions to today's event. With this, I would like to close uh, the event and thank you all for joining us and see you next month. Goodbye.